Thank you all for leading us in worship. I love it. Man, that, was, that took me back to like being like an eighth grader, singing Open Up the Eyes of My Heart like almost every Sunday it felt like back then. But man, that was, that was sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, my name is Christian. I'm one of the elders here at Cornerstone. I get the opportunity to open up God's word with us this morning. I'd love to jump right in this morning. We've got some cool stuff to talk about. If you have your Bibles, you can go, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 19. We're still there. We started in uh, January. We, we've been going through the book of Matthew, but we've slowed down here in Matthew chapter 19 to focus in on what Jesus teaches us in this passage about marriage, about divorce, about singleness, about God's good intention for marriage to be this one, one man, one woman, one flesh relationship and that that is God's one intended concept, uh, context for the enjoyment of sex. We've also talked about in this series the way that because of our sin, our rebelliousness against God and his pur purposes, man, we struggle with the good intention of God, either to acknowledge it as good, to not, to not want to reject it and seek our own way, or even if we recognize it as good, we go, but how do I do it? Because I'm fighting so much temptation and just desires that go all over the place in my own life and the difficulties that come in trying to live this out in real life with other people. And that's why throughout this series as well, we keep coming back to this idea of the grace of God that has come through Jesus Christ that is able not just to open our hearts, but to transform our hearts, to change us, give us new desire and new power to live, to pursue the good intention of God. And so in the midst of this process, you know, if you've been with us over the last four weeks, you know that Todd in particular has been walking through in particular what Jesus says in regard to divorce in remarriage and then the way that Paul expands on that in 1 Corinthians 7. Um, he took four weeks to do it because there is a lot of complexity in the way that we navigate different aspects of difficulty in marriage. And if you were with us over the last four weeks, man, um, if you weren't, I would highly encourage you to go back and, and listen to those on our website. I thought Todd, wherever he's at, man, you did such a good job leading us through that with such grace and yet precision and confidence in the goodness of God. But I love the way every Sunday he spoke on behalf of all of us as your elders to say, if you're experiencing difficulty, hardship in your marriage, don't walk through it on your own. Come, walk with us. Let us be there with you. And I, and I would even say over these last couple of weeks, those of you who have reached out and met with very ones of us, just to, to invite people into what you're doing. Thank you. That does take courage. That does take the pouring of courage into your life to navigate these things. But I would say this, again, whether you're married or not, maybe you've never been married, maybe you're a student here this morning for whom like marriage hasn't yet been a possibility. Perhaps over the last four weeks of hearing about the difficulties, the heartache that can come with marriage, maybe it's made you ask the question, should we even do it? <laughs> Is it even worth it? And if so, you're in good company because that's actually the very way that the disciples respond to what Jesus says about divorce and remarriage. Look at this again, starting in verse nine. Jesus' words, he says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual morality and marries another commits adultery. And in response to that, the disciples say to him, if such is the case with a man and his wife, it's better not to marry. They could be speaking sarcastically or even like, like exaggeratedly, like, Gee, Jesus, man, you upped the bar so much. Are you, do you actually mean that we shouldn't even do this thing? Maybe they're even trying to get Jesus to kind of like equivocate or come back a little bit. Okay, could you, could you lower the bar and make it more reachable for us? But look at the way that Jesus responds to them right after that. He says, man, there's something in this. that You may not even recognize the truth in what you're saying, but there's truth in here that you need to focus on. It's interesting, I highlighted that, that phrase up there, this saying that Jesus says is not for everyone, but only for those to whom it's given. Because there's a little bit of a question there about what is the saying that Jesus is talking about? Is Jesus referring to what he said in verse 9 about divorce and remarriage? Or is he referring to what the disciples said in verse 10 about it being better not to marry? And there's kind of good arguments for both sides, but I don't think we need to spend too much time there because whichever way you choose, you end up at the same place. Marriage is a high and holy and heavy calling, and it is not for everyone. And the same thing is true about singleness. It is a good and holy and difficult calling. But is it better? 
Well, in some ways, I guess you could look at it this way. The, 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 the way that Jesus is responding to the disciples' questions, I would put it like this. Is it better not to marry? Is it better? I say Jesus says, for some, yes. Yes, it is better not to marry. Is it easier? Is it the path of less resistance? No, it's not. It's not. If you're, let me just say this. If you're looking for the easy way to follow Jesus, the easy path to follow Jesus, you will not find it either through marriage or through singleness. As a matter of fact, if what you're looking for is an easy way to follow Jesus, you won't find it anywhere. Remember what Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 6, 7, in the Sermon on the Mount. When he said, enter, actually, no, I forget where it's at. It's in the Sermon on the Mount, somewhere in Matthew 5 through 7. <laughs> enter by the narrow gate because the way is broad. The way is easy that leads to what? Destruction. But how does he describe that one path that leads to life? It's narrow. It's hard. There's few who find it. And yet Jesus says here, on that one path of following him to life that is truly life, there are two normative conditions in which we walk that path. Marriage and singleness. There is no easy path. It's more of a matter of which way will you walk this path. Many of us will be entrusted with marriages for seasons of our lives. But hear me. Every one of us begins life single. Most of us, even if you are married currently, will have seasons of singleness in the future in your life, whether that's because of a divorce or the death of a spouse. All of us have seasons of singleness in our life. So it is essential for all of us to pay careful attention to what Jesus says about the value of singleness, the opportunity of singleness, to value it like, to see it like Jesus saw it, to value it like Jesus valued it. Because it's not just a reality that we will face, it is an opportunity that we can seek to seize and steward well when it's given to us. That's why, actually, uh, Todd's been talking. I don't know if I've ever had a, a, a sermon that's been more built up than each week. As Todd would say, next week, Jesus, Christian will talk about singleness. Next week, Christian will talk about singleness. Like, I hope, I, I hope in some ways I can live up to those expectations. Maybe some of you guys have been waiting for a month for us to get there. But one of the ways I'm going to do that, I'm not just going to try to do this in one fell swoop. We're actually going to take two weeks to walk through singleness. I'm going to take time this morning to really try to focus in on the betterness of it. What is the value, the opportunity, the advantage that Jesus and Paul in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 7 see in singleness? To see the indispensable role that God intends it to play, the good intention that God has for singleness. And then come back the next week to talk about maybe some of the more particular difficulties that we face for those who seek to walk this path. I think it's important to handle it in that direction, to talk about the positive, the advantages, the opportunity first instead of the difficulties, because I think actually within the church, we tend to flip that around. When we talk about singleness, if we talk about singleness, we tend to start with what single people don't have that married people do have. You don't have a spouse with whom you can be intimate, both relationally and sexually. The, the opportunity to bear children, to build that American ideal of a nuclear family. And then if we start there, if we even get around to talking about the advantages that Jesus and Paul saw in singleness, because we start with the negative, it's really hard for it not to come across like a consolation prize, right? You missed on the vacation to Europe, but you get a toaster. Like, thanks for playing, right? Like... I would say if singleness seems like a consolation prize for those who missed out on the brass ring of marriage, we are out of step with scripture. That is not the way that Jesus saw it. That is not the way that Paul saw it. It really just comes down to what's the mission, the goal that you're pursuing in your life? Listen to me, if you're here this morning, you're a follower of Jesus, or if you're not and you're considering what it means to follow Jesus, understand this, your primary mission, your primary calling in life is not just to find a spouse, not just to put yourself in a situation where you can have sex without sinning. It's not just to bear children, to build that nuclear family, not that any of those things are wrong, but they are not ultimate. What is that ultimate thing? The thing that Jesus, our King, said that we should seek first the kingdom of God 
his righteousness. More than food or clothing or companionship, seek the kingdom of God to live under the good rule of God and seek to make the goodness of his rule known to others. And if that's what you're seeking, you can do that whether married or single. Paul would say there's even greater advantages to remaining single. Or maybe in the way that Jesus put it, in the climax of Matthew's gospel. Again, this whole gospel leads up to the climax in Matthew 28. When Jesus says, okay, to seek first the kingdom of God, what does that mean? Well, understand this. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus as the risen, exalted son of God. And from that high and exalted position, what does he call us to do? to devote our lives to the making of disciples among all nations. If you and I truly embrace Jesus' mission as our mission, to be disciples, who make disciples, if that is the primary calling in your life, whether you're married or single, each will present you with incredible opportunities to make disciples and significant difficulty to be faced trusting in the grace of God, the word of God, the people of God. Neither one is easy. Both will require us to deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow Jesus. That's what Jesus said was the the call for anyone who would come after him. Which again, keep this in mind. If both marriage and singleness give us opportunities to pursue the mission of making disciples, but that mission calls us to deny ourselves, take up our crosses and follow Jesus, then if selfishness, self-centeredness, a desire to get what I want out of my life is what drives you in your marriage or in your singleness, understand this, selfishness is just as destructive to singleness as it is to marriage. The way we put it in our doctrinal statement was like this. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, A celibate, single life is not only possible, but is to be equally honored alongside marriage as pleasing to God and essential to the life and witness of the church. Do you believe that? It's one thing to believe it up here. Have you experienced that, whether in your life or through the examples of others? Have you and I seen the way that singleness can be equally effective, or even Paul will say more effective for the mission of making disciples. Are we as a church family, have we created the kind of environment in which those who embrace the call to make disciples in singleness feel equally honored alongside those of us who are married? When we wrote this, I took the lead on writing this section of our doctrinal statement. We all kind of affirmed and agreed to it together as elders. But when we wrote this in there about five years ago, it was very aspirational. We were talking about the kind of church we want to be, not necessarily the church that we felt like we were. And I would say over the last five years or so, I do see progress. I do see single people affirmed in their singleness, carrying significant responsibility in the life of our church but I think there is much more room for us to grow. And that's even why I want to spend a couple weeks on this. My prayer, I know on the heart of all of us as elders, is to continue to grow this kind of environment among our church. My hope is that even this message can serve as like a catalyst, an encouragement to those of you who have embraced singleness, to, to cheer you on, to pray for you, that we would be the kind of church that supports you in that. So again, what I want to do, again, continuing today, is look at the advantage of this. See the opportunity And next week, let's talk about the reality of the difficulties. But I would say along the way, man, if this stokes thinking in your own mind or or, or desire to maybe fill this out more in your own mind, there's there's a book that was actually recommended to me from a couple of the single folks in our church that I got a chance to read this week. Fantastic. It's a book called The Seven Myths About Singleness by Sam Albury. He's a a Christian pastor, a a teacher who likewise is a single man, but he writes incredibly in that book. I'll I'll quote a little section of it a little bit later and probably more next week, but if you're looking for, for more information, I would highly recommend this. But again, the thing I said before is that for those of us who follow Jesus, there are these two normative life situations, marriage and singleness. Many of us will have seasons of marriage. All of us will have seasons of singleness. But if we want to talk about, okay, like if we're talking about the goodness, the good intent of God in this, if we want to look at the good intent of God for marriage, well, where does Jesus tell us to look? Where does Paul tell us to look? Go back to Genesis 1 and 2. 
when he made a male and female, when he said a man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. We go back to the beginning to see the good intention of God. But where do we look if we want to see the good intention of God for singleness? Well, I would say in some ways, we, we, the best place to start isn't back at the beginning or even in the Old Testament because the reality is we don't really see singleness as a normative way of life in the Old Testament. From the moment that God said, be fruitful and multiply, the normative condition for most people has been to get married and seek to be fruitful and multiply. I mean, even especially like Genesis 15, when God promises to Abraham and his, and his wife Sarah, though they're barren and can't have children, that some way through the power of God, they would have as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. Well, from that point on, the family of Abraham goes, no, like to get married, to seek to have children is a command, it is a duty, it's a responsibility. It's how we seek to fulfill, see the fulfillment of that promise. And so we really don't see in the Old Testament singleness as a normative way of life. There are a couple examples, uh, exceptions, I would say, people who stand out. Probably the clearest one is the prophet Jeremiah, who actually is called by God to not marry and not have children. But outside of that, my whole point is to say, in the Old Testament, there's one norm for adults. Get married, have children if you can. We, don't, we see some exceptions, but not another norm. I think that's actually something that Jesus is instituting right here in this passage in Matthew 19 that we're at. He is moving the ball forward, if you will. He, he, he is introducing a new concept of normative singleness for followers of Jesus. But because it's a new concept, he can't really pull off an existing concept, or at least he, he starts with one that's actually rather foreign to us, but it was common enough, even if it's a bit awkward, it was common enough to the people in his day that at least could serve as a starting point for him to develop this new concept for them. Look again, Matthew 19. Look at verse 11. Again, the disciples say it's probably better not to marry. So Jesus says, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it's given. And then he says this in verse 12. There are eunuchs who have been so from birth. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. There are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He goes to eunuchs. What's a eunuch? All right, I, I'll, I'll make it awkward for us for just a second. I'm not going to try to be crass. A eunuch was a male servant, typically who would serve, he, a male slave who served in the court of a pagan king who that king would take and castrate. He would remove his testicles so that we, he could not reproduce. He could not bear children. That's where Jesus starts. <laughs> I mean, okay, I want to make really clear to you. I don't think that Jesus is condoning this practice. He is referring to a commonly understood practice. The Jews didn't really practice it, but among their dispersion, there's even a good chance maybe Daniel and his friends in the book of, of Daniel went through that. But they were, common, they were familiar with the idea that a king would do this to some of his male servants. Why would he do that? Well, on the one hand, some, some scholars think that most likely what it was was a king, kings at that day typically had a lot of wives and concubines and daughters and things like that. And you needed servants to take care of your wives without getting any funny business going on. And so you do that, so that way then they could serve the, serve the wives. That may have been the case with, part, with some of them, but we do see in history examples of eunuchs serving in all kinds of different ways. It wasn't just about sex. Here's what I think the main point of the whole practice of eunuchs was. If you do that to a man, you remove his opportunity to build a household of his own, which means he doesn't have to focus on his own household, and he can be fully devoted to the king's household, to the king's business. If he has a wife and family, his interests are going to be divided. His time is going to be divided. So a king would do this, so that way that, that servant is now completely dependent upon the king for his livelihood, even his care in his old age, which means he's going to be heavily invested in the health of the king's household. He's going to be heavily invested in the king's business. It was more about securing their focused, undivided devotion than it was just about sex. Again, that's a foreign concept to us, but I think for Jesus, it was common enough that this is a place for him to start. And again, right here, he talks about three different types of eunuchs. He says there are some who will be that way from birth, most likely referring to a, a physical deformation in their body, a birth defect, if you will, that makes them unable to reproduce. 
Then he talks about those who are made that way by people. These would have been common for them. But with the third one, I really do think Jesus is breaking new ground. He is introducing a new idea. This idea that there will be some who will make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Not literally mutilating their bodies. That's really clear to me, and that's important to make clear. I don't think that we are to take Jesus' words literally here about castration any more than we need to take literally what he said in Matthew 5 about if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. The point there was to say, whatever it takes to fight temptation in your life, do it. Give sin no quarter in your life. Don't coddle it or cuddle it or keep a manageable amount of it. Cut it off is his point. And here, his point is different. His point, I would say here, is to say that there will be some of those who trust and follow Jesus who will refrain from marrying and bearing children, not just so they can keep their options open, Not so they can avoid adult responsibility or live in a state of delayed adolescence. But they will do this, he says, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. They will do this, he says, so that like a eunuch in a king's court, they can serve the king with undivided devotion. Do you see that? Here's another thing that's interesting to me. I don't even think that Jesus is just saying that this is something others will do. I actually think Jesus is being self-referential here. Who do we see talk more than anybody else about the kingdom of God? Jesus. Who willingly refrained from marriage and having children to be devoted to his father's business? Jesus. He is the example of this lifestyle that he's talking about. But he also makes it clear in saying that there will be those who do this, that he's saying this isn't just for me or guys like John the Baptist or Jeremiah or something like that. I am establishing a new norm for those who follow me. This isn't just for me, it's for those who are part of my kingdom too. But again, he says, it's not for everyone. Not everyone can receive this. It's only for those to whom it is given. Okay, let's stop and talk about that for a second because this is interesting because when you look at verse 12, It seems that there's a matter of choice in this, right? He speaks about these people who will choose. They will make themselves eunuchs. They will put themselves in this life situation. But yet in verse 11, first, he says that it's something that they're given. So which is it? Is it something they choose or something that they're given? It's interesting to me, over the last couple of weeks, I have had a chance to talk with several different single folks in our church who I do think are seeking to live their singleness well. And here's the one thing I found. Not one of them said, yeah, I chose this. Most actually said, actually, no, if I had the choice, I would have chosen something different. If it were up to you, you'd make a different choice. Perhaps you struggle deeply with the idea that your singleness has been given to you by God because it doesn't seem to fit the way you're wired, what you might desire. It's almost like God forgot you're right-handed and he bought you like a left-handed baseball glove and you're like, what do, I, what do I do with this? Do you not know who I am? God, if you gave this to me, did you give me a gift receipt? Because I would really like to be able to take it back, if you will. And again, I say that a little bit as a joke, but guys, I understand that for some of you, there is so much pain connected to your singleness. I would say maybe even especially if some of you have been married in the past, but through divorce or the death of your spouse, you now find yourself single. And I don't want you in any way to hear me try to minimize or downplay your pain at all. If you're struggling in the midst of singleness, I would say the same thing that Todd said about those of you struggling in the midst of marriage. Don't do it on your own. Let us walk with you. But I would say this, even if your singleness is not something that you would choose, that doesn't mean that there isn't still an opportunity in it. An opportunity for God to use you right where you are right now, to even empower you by his grace and then deploy you in that mission to make disciples even or even especially in your singleness. If you've, you may not have chosen to be single, but I would say this, you can choose today and continue to choose to seek to steward the singleness that he has given you with a single-minded devotion to God. That's my prayer for y'all. 
Man, that's what I think Paul argues for in 1 Corinthians 7. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there with me. Let's look at what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 7. He says a lot about marriage and singleness. We've been going through this chapter a lot. We'll look at it more over the next couple of weeks as well. But look at the way that Paul starts in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7. He says on the one hand, he goes, guys, I'm writing this whole church of people, and I wish that all of you were like I am. Well, what do you mean like you are, Paul? Well, he says there at the end of verse 8, I wish that all of you could remain single as I am. There's an opportunity here. I have embraced this eunuch for the kingdom lifestyle, Paul is saying, and I wish all of you could do it too. It is worth it. But just like Jesus said, he said it's not for everyone. He says each has his own gift from God. It's something given, like Jesus said. And he says there's gifts of one kind and gifts of another. In the context of this chapter, he's talking about marriage and singleness. Those are the two gifts that he's talking about. So if your marriage, your marriage is a gift with all of its difficulty and complication, there is opportunity there. And the same is true if you're single. But here's what we have to keep in mind. Paul talks a lot about this idea of gifts in the book of 1 Corinthians. And we have to understand this. When Paul talks about gifts, even later, spiritual gifts in like chapter 12 and so forth, please understand me. He's not first and foremost talking about a supernatural ability. It's not about an ability. It's not about something that you're particularly passionate about or even something that you feel particularly good at. A gift is a role or task that's been entrusted to you by God as a means to serve and bless others. Paul talks about it as a, a manifest, manifestation of the Spirit to, for the common good, to build others up. The root word of this idea of gift is the word grace, charismata. And his point there is to say, God gives us roles and opportunities in our lives that are to be a means through which his grace works in our lives into the lives of others. To build up and bless others. And both marriage and singleness, Paul says, are such gracious roles to play. Means of grace to build others up, not just to seek your own way. Yeah, but they're both really hard. Yeah, Again, that's why the gift is not about something coming easy to us. It's not about how easy it comes to you, but how you embrace the opportunity laid in within it and develop that potential to serve others. I want to share a couple quotes with you from some books that were really helpful to me. One, surprisingly enough, was a book on marriage that has a phenomenal chapter on singleness. I found as I've read books on marriage and singleness, I learn a lot about singleness through books on marriage. And I learn a lot about marriage through books on singleness. Like we really do need both of these to be in conversation with each other to have a rounded out picture. But Tim Keller in his book on marriage, it was a fantastic book on marriage, he has a chapter in there on singleness. And he talks a lot about this idea of a gift of singleness and what it's like and what it's not like. It's a little bit long, but watch this. He says on the one, he says, Paul is not speaking then of a gift of singleness as some kind of elusive, stress-free state. The giftness of being single for Paul lay in the freedom it gave him to concentrate on ministry in ways that a married man could not. Paul may very well then have experienced what we today would call an emotional struggle with singleness. He might have wanted to be married. He not only found an ability to live a life of service to God and others in that situation, he discovered and capitalized on the unique features of single life such as time flexibility, to minister with very great effectiveness. One more. Consider then that the single calling Paul speaks of is neither a condition without any struggle, nor on the other hand, an experience of misery. It is fruitfulness in life and ministry through the single state. When you have this gift, there may indeed be struggles but the main thing is that God is helping you to grow spiritually and be fruitful in the lives of others despite those struggles. If you are single and you're listening to me right now, have you experienced a taste of what Tim Keller's talking about right here? Spiritual growth in your own life, not just in spite of your singleness, but through it. Fruitful ministry, service in the life of others, not in spite of your singleness, but because of it. 
Again, if you're single, whether or not you feel particularly gifted for singleness, do you at least acknowledge that it is something that has been given to you by God in this season of your life? Are you able to acknowledge that it's not accidental? You may not have anticipated it, but it did not slip God's mind. He didn't get you mixed up with someone else who would be better suited for your situation. In that other book by Sam Albury that I talked about, he talked about the way that even amongst himself and other single people, you can kind of chuckle and go, why did God give me something I don't want? And look at what he says. This is challenging, but really beautiful. Watch what he says. He says, while single people may chuckle at the idea of God giving such a potentially unwanted gift, we need to be careful and recognize what and who it is that we're laughing at. God is no fool. He's not the uncle who thinks you're 12 when you're well into your 30s and sends you childish gifts. He's the creator who made you and knows you. He's the one who orders all things and does so for your good. To roll your eyes at what a well-meaning but mistaken relative gives is one thing. To roll our eyes at omniscience, God's all-knowing nature is another. If we balk at the idea of singleness being a gift, it's not because God has misunderstood us, but because we have not understood him. Again, God is wise and good. Your situation is not a mistake. Will you seek to trust him, whether married or single, in a healthy marriage, a difficult marriage, healthy singleness, difficult singleness, will you trust him and seek to understand why he has put you where he has and harness the potential of that? It's a cheesy greeting card saying, but there's truth in it. Will you seek to bloom where you're planted? Or, or not? That's Paul's point in verse 7 again, right? Look at this. I wish everyone was like I am. This is a gift from God. Verse 8, he says, it's good to remain single. Do you believe the giftedness, the goodness, the advantage of it? But then again, look at what he says in verse 9. But if you choose this path, it will require you to exercise self-control. In the context, he is clearly talking about sexual self-control. We'll get into that more detail next week because I would say sexual self-control and singleness is a particular burden for those who choose this lifestyle. We've talked a lot over the last few weeks that we as married people, those of us who are married, need sexual self-control too, but it does look different. There's a different way of directing it. But I would just say this, before we'll unpack it more next week. Remember this. Sexual self-control, like any kind of self-control, is not about what comes naturally to us. Self-control is a learned skill. It is a spiritual discipline. Paul says in Galatians 5, it is a fruit of the Spirit, an outcome of walking in dependence upon God. We all need to learn that in, and practice that in our various callings. But I would just say this. Remember what Paul's doing here in 1 Corinthians. He's taking what Jesus said in Matthew 19 to a predominantly Jewish setting and applying it in a much more Greco-Roman Gentile setting. And so on the one hand, we know the Jewish people didn't really have a concept for like normative singleness as a life situation. So he has to build that out for them. On the other hand, in a Greco-Roman setting, they had a concept for singleness. What they didn't have a concept for was celibacy. To be single in a Greco-Roman context didn't mean you weren't having sex. It just meant you didn't have a husband or wife to have sex with. But that's what prostitutes were for. That's what slaves were for. That's what mistresses were for and so forth. So Paul has to clarify for the Corinthians in their culture in a way that also needs to be clarified in our culture that the biblical idea of singleness involves refraining from both marriage and sexual acts, whether with others or by yourself. It is celibate, abstinent, singleness. And let me just say this. That was a really hard sell for people living in an oversex culture like Corinth in the same way that it's a hard sell for people living in an oversex culture like ours. And yet, notice the way that Paul, who embraced this lifestyle himself, is not bashful or timid at all in saying, this is good, and if you can, you should go after this too. 
There is an advantage. There is an opportunity because of the opportunity that it gives us for the sake of mission. Look what he says a little bit later in verse 25 when he comes back now. And he says, he talks about these ones that he calls the betrothed. The, probably the best way to understand it is he's talking about virgins, those who were never married. At other places, he talks about the unmarried, perhaps those who had been married but currently aren't. He talks about widows. In some ways, we can group them all under the general banner of singleness. But there are unique stresses and hardships in each of those. I wish we had time to go into all of that, we probably won't, but I hope that again the general principle gives us enough to then begin to wade into this together as a church family. But he says again here, to the betrothed, to those never married, he says, I have no command. I'm not giving you a command from God. I'm giving you my judgment and my recommendation as one who by the Lord's mercy is considered trustworthy. I think in view of the present distress, it's good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be free. If you're married, stay married. Are you free from a wife? Don't seek a wife. Don't get married if you're not. He says this idea of in view of the present distress. There's a lot of ink that's been spilled trying to understand what that is. It could be meaning something very specific to the area of Corinth. They're going through a famine or civil unrest, something like that. Or it could be Paul's way of just referring to the, the, the fact that living in this time between when Jesus came the first time and when he comes again is just going to be filled with all kinds of distress. But again, his whole point is just to say, in light of the fact that there is uncertainty and hardship and, and toil in life, whatever path you take, remain where you are. Serve Jesus. Devote yourself to being and making disciples in whatever situation you find yourself in. He says again, if you want to get married, there in verse 28, if you do marry, it's not a sin. It's, if you choose to get married, it's not a sin. But he says you will have worldly troubles. Trouble is actually in the flesh, in the body. You, you will have difficulties in life because of that. And Paul says, almost like with a fatherly tone, it's at least with con worth considering if it's worth it to spare yourself that if you're not already in that situation. It will make your life more complex. There will be troubles. And again, that really became clear over the last four weeks as we walked through issues regarding divorce and remarriage, didn't it? There is hard work and heartache even in healthy marriage, and it's just compounded when marriage is unhealthy. In other words, Paul's saying, if you aren't married but you'd like to be, which is who he's talking about here in this passage, you can do it, but you better not do it flippantly. You better not do it lightly. It is a hard and heavy calling. It will give you incredible opportunities to experience God's grace to put the gospel on display, but it will make your life more complicated. It will make it more complex, and you need to carefully consider if it's better to spare yourself that. Again, that's not to say that singleness is easier, but I would say this. In general, a single life can be simpler, less complex than marriage and, and a nuclear family because there's less moving parts to it. That doesn't mean that single people have license to just be self-centered, to just follow their own pleasures, but what it can mean is that the simplicity of singleness can give you more margin, capacity with your time and energy to come alongside others, to bear other people's burdens. I know single people in this church where, you know, even as we've talked about this, you go, my life ain't simple. My life ain't easy. But I look at your life and I go, I see, but that's because I see the way that in your singleness, you have embraced the opportunity to come alongside others and carry heavy responsibility, to be a caregiver for elderly or disabled family and friends, to devote countless hours to discipling students in our student ministry. Some of you use your, the, the, the flexibility of your singleness to travel a lot, not just to go see the sites, but to support missionaries and church planners in various places. There's some widows in our church who in their widowhood, just go, let's gather together, let's know one another, let's support each other, and let's find opportunities to serve our church family. Single people serve and care and counsel and disciple in so many ways, and I love it, and I want to cheer you on. Please hear that from me today. I say that on the other hand as someone who, again, God's path in my life led to marriage pretty early on. I felt like I had like 15 minutes of singleness as an adult. I got married at 22, which is pretty young. My wife and I just celebrated 18 years of marriage last month, which is amazing. Where's she, where's she at? She's hiding. 
I love you, babe. Oh my gosh, I, no joke. We, we, we literally talk about it all the time. Like we, we get it that this marriage is till death do us part, but we hope that's a long way off. We love living life. I love you. I love living life with you, serving Jesus with you. My four kids who are still in the home, I love you. I am honored and humbled by the responsibility that I have to seek to do what Ephesians 6 says, to bring you up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. But Having said that, I don't want you to think that I'm like a discontent in the situation where God's put me. I will say, marriage and family makes me feel really spread thin a lot of the time. Every day there are five people who have claim to my time, my energy, my attention, my prayer, my service. And again, I love it. I love my family but it does mean that there is less left over to care for you. Even though I'm full-time on staff here at the church, there is a spread thinness, if you will. And Paul says that's one of the realities that comes with marriage. It does spread you thinner, which means a corresponding advantage of embracing singleness is that it can give you more attention and energy, allow you to be more focused, less divided on serving Jesus and serving others. That's what he says in verse 32. He says on the one hand, I want you to be free from anxieties. Don't, don't read into that. Okay, hold on, stop for a second. That word anxiety takes on a whole bunch of different connotations in our modern time. Paul's not talking about a, a psychological state, a, a psychological idea of anxiety, anxiety attacks, and so forth. The, the word probably could be better translated just cares, concerns. I want you to, like legitimate things that we should care about and give time to. So don't think it's something bad just because that word anxiety is, is, um, can often have a bad connotation. Paul is saying, on the other hand, though, it's not that, okay, be carefree and don't take on any responsibility. But he is calling us to carefully consider the amount, the breadth of cares and concerns that we take on. He says, again, look at this. Those who are single, the unmarried have greater opportunity not to not care about things, but to be anxious to care about the things of the Lord, he says. Now, throughout church history, there are people who have taken that verse right there and said, see the monastic life of retreating into privacy and endless contemplation. That's the best way to live. And you won't hear me talk bad about solitude and contemplation. They are things that I deeply love and sometimes get to practice in my life. But what, Jesus, what Paul's talking about here is not a life of isolation and contemplation on a hilltop somewhere. To focus on the things that please the Lord means to seek to use our time and energy like Jesus did. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. That's the things of the Lord. To pour yourself out in service to God by loving and serving his people, that is the opportunity that Paul says a single person is able to stay more focused on than a married person. He says, on the other hand, a married person is anxious about worldly things, how to please their spouse. Now again, stop there for a second because sometimes we can use that word, word worldly as a euphemism, as a synonym for something that's sinful and wrong. And there are some times where it has that connotation in Scripture, like in 1 John, where he says, don't love the world, the things of the world, because if you love the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. That's not what I think Paul's talking about here. He's not saying that there is something inherently sinful or wrong about seeking to care for your spouse in marriage. When he says worldly, I think he basically just means things that pertain to this physical world and the way that things are right now. You will be more consumed with just worldly cares and concerns. You won't be able to, in other words, live as simply. I mean, just think about it practically. For some of us who are married, who have children, you know, it takes more food to feed two people than one, right? Then you put a bunch of little mouths in there too, and it just compounds it. That costs more. You need more space in your home. I remember when my wife and I first got married, we moved to this little two-bedroom place. In my idealistic college mind, I was like, this is all I'll ever need. <laughs> one bathroom, two bedrooms? Man, once we had like a bunk bed, a crib, and then had to find room for one more baby... Maybe we do need a little more space than this. And for the better part of a year, we were consumed with a very worldly thing of trying to find a home that would accommodate our family better. But there was a lot of financial wranglings to do. There was a lot of different thoughts. It just costs more. If you take on the responsibility of marriage and raising children, 
It will require more time and energy and resources to do that. You will have to be more focused than maybe you want to be on making sure that you make enough money, which will most often lead you to having to spend more time away from your family working in order to be able to provide for your family. And because most of your energy is going there, you'll come home, and that's when, Daddy, can you play this? Can you do that? And you're going, I got nothing left. I spent it all at work. You feel spread thin. And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Not at all. Just understand that by getting married, by having children, you are assuming responsibility for that spouse and children in a way that means you would be unfaithful to your family and to God if you did not devote perhaps a majority of your time and energy into providing for that family. You will still honor God and serve him by the way you seek to do that, but it will spread you thinner, which means that if you are not currently married, but you want to be, Paul would say, don't do it flippantly. Be really clear about both what you would be committing to in taking that on and also what you would be giving up, the opportunities to live a more simple, focused life by embracing your singleness. I mean, just think about Paul, for instance. Think about who's talking to us here. If you're familiar with his life, like in the book of Acts, you see how much he traveled and spent copious amounts of time, months and years in different cities, preaching the gospel, planning churches, writing letters like 1 Corinthians to one of those churches. Do you think he would have been able to accomplish as much if he had a wife and children with him? Not to say that's bad at all, but it would have spread him thinner. It would have limited him. Not only that, think about his sufferings, his imprisonment. I'm not saying that it was a walk in the park the way he was beat and imprisoned and shipwrecked and things like that. But can you imagine the added stress of having a wife and children with him in those situations? Or vice versa, flip it around if you're a woman. Added stress of a husband and children. It's not just talking about men in that situation. Imagine what it would have been like if they're thrown in prison with him or if they're left destitute and dependent upon others because he's in prison. Now, there's grace for God even in, from God even in the midst of those situations, but I would say this. Paul was able to serve and suffer the way that he did and accomplish as much as he did because of the way that the grace of God empowered him to embrace this more simple, less complex life of singleness. He was able to be one of those eunuchs like Jesus talked about who was able to serve Jesus with undivided devotion. That's his whole point when he comes to the end here. He says, I say this for your benefit. I'm not trying to lay a restraint on you. The word is literally noose. I'm not trying to put a noose around your neck. There's something beneficial here that I want you to see. I want to promote your good order and secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. There is real benefit, real advantage in choosing to embrace a single life with all its struggles. That's what we'll come back and talk about next week. But here's the way that I want to wrap it up today. Do you, do I, do we actually see the opportunity that Paul saw in singleness? Again, if you are single, whether, again, you're a widow, widower, divorced, or you've never been married, or you're you're just now coming into adulthood, the first time that marriage could be a possibility for you, do you, are you able to recognize the opportunity that God has for you in your singleness, even with the difficulties it'll present? Are you willing to consider that your circumstance, again, is not accidental, but could even be advantageous to devoting yourself to make disciples? Have you begun to experience that in your life? Have you begun to harness the potential of your singleness? Again, not to seek your own desires, but to serve Jesus. For those of us who are married, on the other hand, as we seek to be faithful with the marriages that God has given to us, do you and I see how important singleness is to the health and mission of our church? It is a necessity. Again, the way we put it in that doctrinal statement. It is to be equally honored alongside marriage as pleasing to God and essential to the life and witness of the church. If you are married in here, do you have friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, who are single, who you seek to honor and encourage in their singleness? Do you also keep in mind that most likely you will still have seasons of singleness in your future too? Again, I think there has been growth in our church in this area. There is room for us to continue to grow 
We've got single people carrying significant responsibility in several areas of our church. But one thing I would say, I don't think we've always done a good job of highlighting those individuals. Not to create poster child. I was talking to a few single people. They're like, I don't want to become like the poster child of singleness here at Cornerstone. It's not about somehow just putting them on a pedestal. But I do think that in the Christian life, regardless of how you, the, the path that your life walks, it's important for us to have role models. It's important for us to have real life examples of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Again, not perfect models. There are none except for Jesus. But people who give us an example of what it looks like to honestly pursue God's good intent, whether in marriage or in singleness. The way that Paul talked about it, he says, imitate me like I imitate Jesus. Do we have imitable examples of this? I think the reality is the majority of the people that you often get to hear from in this setting are married people like me, like Todd and so forth. We haven't always done as good of a job of saying, hey, here are people who are seeking to walk this path well. So that's the way that I want to wrap things up today. I want to bring up someone who's a part of our church. We'll do this again next week with someone else. But I want to bring up someone in our church who I believe is a followable example of what it means to live a single life for the sake of making disciples. I'm going to ask him to come up and just pray for our church. To first to pray for those of us who are single. That God would help us to harness the opportunity that there is there. And even to pray for us as a church family that we would become the kind of environment, the family where this is honored and supported. So the guy I'm going to bring up, um, I'll say this first so he doesn't feel awkward when I bring him up. I'm going to ask Josh Sirhusen to come up in just a second. Some of you guys know him. He grew up here uh, through his teen years at Cornerstone. He's a product of our student ministry. And for the last 13 years, he has served in our high school ministry. I mean, think about that. Four years of high school for most people. That's multiple generations, at least three generations of high schoolers that he's gotten to be a part of discipling. And even some of them now have begun to follow in Josh's footsteps and they're now serving in our junior high and high school ministry to do the same thing that Josh did with them. Some of you guys, when he comes up, you might recognize him because most often he's probably up here, he's standing over by the baptismal tank because God has used him to walk many young men through that decision to follow Jesus and publicly proclaim it, which is amazing. But I'll say this, I know singleness hasn't been easy for him. I know in some ways it's probably not what he would have chosen or envisioned for himself, yet I do see him as someone who is an example of what it looks to grow in faithfulness and leveraging singleness for the sake of making disciples. And I would say, I really mean this, man. I, I deeply respect you and, and the example that your life has been to many. So all that to say, I'm done talking. Would you welcome up Josh? He's gonna pray for us before we sing one last song together. Good morning. Um, yes, I'm Josh. Um, I, I'm not special. There, there are plenty of uh, single believers here who do so much for this church, and it is an honor and a privilege to get to be up here um, and represent a, a group of people um, that clearly I identify with. But uh, I just, I just want to be very clear that 13 years is a long time, um, and people often ask me, "How, how exactly do you do that?" And I have. Uh, I feel in large part been unsuccessful in recruiting people to come serve in student ministries. People may look at my life and go, I, I can't do that. Um, and I, I can't either, to be honest. Um, it, is, it is absolutely the work of the Lord that allows us to do any ministry in any way, whether you're single or married. Um, this church does not need more Josh Zerhusens. The Lord needs you in whatever state you are currently in to take on the task of making disciples. Um, we are called to one mission, and that is to glorify God, to make his name known, and to baptize those who follow him, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, it, is, it is such an honor to be a, a, a part of this church and to be a leader amongst high school students. Um, if there is anything followable in my example I, it is that I can boast in my weakness. Um, I am desperately clinging to the word of God every single day. I, in of myself, love sin. I would pursue sin. Should, would it not be for God's grace in my life? I would not be up here. Um, there is absolutely nothing special about me other than that the Lord has chosen to use me and he continues to use me. Um, and in that, I find my, my security that my name is written absolutely in the book of life, and I am not the one who wrote it there. Um, so praise God for that. Would you join me in praying? Dear Lord, I, uh, God, I thank you for just 
your church and the way in which you've equipped your saints. Lord, I pray for those in this audience um, who do not yet know you. Uh, Lord, for those who, who believe that they believe in you, Lord, that you'd make it so clear what it is that you call us to do. Lord, for my brothers and sisters who find themselves in a season of singleness or a season of singleness is around the corner, Lord, I, I pray that you would, um, Lord, that you would encourage them, God, that you would bring them closer to you, Lord, as, as the world comes in around us, Lord, that we would be those shining lights, Lord, that ultimately, ultimately we reflect you more than anything. God, I, I thank you for the beautiful marriages that are in this church, Lord, and the way in which those uniquely reflect your grace and your goodness. Uh, again, God, I, I just thank you for your mission. God, you don't, you absolutely don't need me, but what a privilege it is to get to walk with you, to share you with others. Dear God, in your holy name, amen.